This video is a follow-up and response to many of the comments and criticisms I've seen on my original video, Why Elitism in FPS Games Needs to Die. So if you haven't seen that yet, I would recommend you watch that video before this one so you get an idea of everything I'm talking about. I've always thought about making a follow-up of some kind to that first video for a while now due to not only how it somehow become my most viewed video, but also because some of my viewpoints since then have changed a tiny bit and I feel some people have misunderstood a bit what I was trying to say. I want to emphasize, I still stand by the general message of my video, but I feel I could have stayed some things a bit better to make my point more clear. And I don't blame anyone or hold ill will for any weird or negative reactions to the video either. That project was my first real attempt towards getting some kind of attention and getting my thoughts out there on YouTube, and it's honestly kind of bad now in comparison to the stuff I've made now over the past few months. I'm also probably not going to touch on absolutely everything commenters have brought up either, because either their arguments made completely in bad faith and just missing the point of what I was trying to say in the first place, or just irrelevant to the topic entirely. Also, I want to give a quick shout out to Franco, who not only genuinely helped me a lot in writing this video and helping me understand what a lot of people are trying to say in response to that video, but even brought up a number of good points that I failed to bring up in my original video. I'll leave a link to his channel in the description, give him some love, he really did help a lot. Alright, here we go. The first and likely most major thing I feel I could have done differently in that video was to split it in two, and have one video dedicated to the retro-modern divide, and another specifically about Doom Eternal's community issues. I kind of put both of these together in one video because, for one, the whole Tag 2 drama happened right as I was writing that and I really wanted to talk about it because it meant a lot to me, and honestly, I don't think this was the best idea looking back since the two topics don't have much relation to each other other than maybe sharing the topic of elitist people. And I think some people misinterpreted what I was trying to say as a result of me attempting to blend together these two video topics. I don't even think elitism was the right word either to use in retrospect when talking about the animosity people have towards modern styled FPS games. It's more of a general divide than anything else, and the petty desire of some to appear better than others just because they like something that they don't. Hell, I even highlighted the modern retro subject matter specifically in the video title itself, so a lot of people were caught off guard as a result when the halfway point hit and I just started talking about Doom and its community, so I can understand the confusion a bit in that regard. But let's talk about the general message of my video. Many took away that the point of my video was to force people to like modern style shooters like Halo and COD, and that I was passing judgement on those who didn't like those games in general or hated the mechanics associated with them, which isn't true at all. My goal with that video was one of two things. The first was to tell my story. The story of me in high school, genuinely convinced that modern shooters like COD and Halo were the worst things to grace the gaming industry and then feeling deceived once I tried them for myself and genuinely enjoyed them and became a massive fan. And the second was to eliminate some of those preconceived negative notions that some people have about modern FPS franchises, to be accepting of those who did like them even if they personally didn't, and maybe to get people who had similar experiences to mine to open themselves up to maybe trying these games for themselves. And you can see this in a lot of comments. For every comment disagreeing with me, there's a bunch of others that felt like I was telling their story and appreciate hearing my words, and others that similarly finally felt compelled to actually try COD and Halo after being put off for so long due to similar experiences. But let it be known that the point was never to force people to like something that they didn't, and that goes for both sides of the discussion. I've had people come to me saying that they didn't enjoy the slower, more methodical tempo of a campaign like COD and PC and gravitated more to something faster like Doom as a result. Or even saying how they didn't like how fast a game like Doom Eternal felt to them on a console, and that they felt that a game like Halo was better suited for them because of what they liked playing on. Both of these are completely valid opinions to have, and I won't take away anyone's feelings on that subject. What I was against in my video was blind, irrational hate. The very same hate that I shared all those years ago. I'm not talking about normal dislike for those types of games. I have no issue with that. I'm talking about actively rubbing games like COD and Halo off as if they were objectively bad for the industry, had absolutely no creative merit or passion to them, and that anybody who liked them were brainless idiots. 
And I don't blame anyone for having those emotions either for the record, because that is due to something that, while I do briefly address in my video, I could have admittedly emphasized more on, and that's the overuse of modern mechanics in games during the late 2000s. The reason so many people have an emotional, personal reaction to modern mechanics and in turn franchises like Call of Duty and Halo is because they infested the majority of FPS games in the 7th gen, unnecessarily being included in the franchises that didn't have them prior, not because developers and publishers genuinely believed it helped the design of what they wanted to create, but because in their eyes, it guaranteed success. Halo and COD's mechanics work in the context of those games because they are inherently baked into the design of the game and are built around it. But the lesson a lot of the industry took from those games was that if you put those mechanics in your game, it would automatically mean success in large sales numbers. By the late 2000s and early 2010s, there were no real arena shooters that could stand their ground alongside Halo and COD and FPS games became more of a console-focused genre rather than a PC-focused one like it was prior. And this led not only to shoddy, console-fied PC ports with a visible lack of many of the things that made PC gaming appealing, but also an oversaturation of what many considered a downgrade in design, and an unnecessary infestation into franchises people loved already as they were. If you liked the first-person shooters of the 90s and early 2000s and didn't personally enjoy COD or Halo, you were unfortunately shit out of luck during the 7th gen. And that's why there was this palpable excitement from many when games like Doom came out in 2016 and proved to be a monumental success. Because with the exception of a few titles, most FPS games you saw would be modeled after modern franchises like COD and Halo. And the ones that did feel more rooted with the faster gameplay of the 90s usually either weren't that financially successful or just didn't have a big player base to support them. With the release of Doom in 2016, it felt like the FPS fans of old could finally enjoy their genre again and not be wiped to the side by types of games that they didn't enjoy. It proved that faster shooters still had a place in the industry and could be financially successful in the process. It's why I said in my Duke Nukem video that I feel the genre is at the best place it's ever been at now, because both audiences have something that they can enjoy. Retro fans can have their games, while modern fans have their own games to enjoy. This entire situation regarding the state of the genre during this specific point in time is something I really shouldn't have glossed over looking back, because it is a very valid reason as to why people feel the way they do, and I feel like some people took this as me saying that their own experiences didn't count and that they had to like all kinds of FPS games if they considered themselves a fan of the genre. I regret a little bit in retrospect saying how we shouldn't celebrate FPS games by the labels of retro and modern, because the truth is that both subgenres play a lot differently to the point where it just won't be to everyone's personal tastes, and in general, not every self-proclaimed fan of FPS games is gonna like all FPS games. And that's totally okay. We're all allowed to celebrate what we love while saying that another isn't for you. All I ask at the end of the day is respect on both ends, and not treat something as simple as liking a certain subgenre of something as such a bad thing. Because while it has gotten better over the years, it is something I still see unfairly all these years later. That being said, I've noticed in many of the responses to my video that a lot of people are fine and more accepting when it comes to the topic of Halo's place in the FPS genre, which is good. I feel like having MCC on PC helped a lot of people finally open up to it. Hell, some were even confused as to why I brought it up as they thought basically nobody hated the series. But at the same time, I've noticed that a lot of people still have this bias towards Call of Duty as a franchise, believing that it's completely soulless and that only idiots play it, and I just feel that's unfair. Once again, I am not going to force anyone to like it, but to act as if this series has no positive or artistic merit whatsoever is just wrong. Again, you can like and feel whatever way you want about it. Even I have my issues with the series at large. But there's just so much more to this series than what most people assume, and I don't even have enough time to actually get into it and say just why without this video being an hour longer than it needs to be. So keep an eye out in the future for a more COD-centric video discussing just why this series is special. But for now, let's focus on the same game argument when it comes to the series. 
A lot of people in the comments frequently love to bring up FIFA when trying to describe how similar Call of Duty is every year. And I'm sorry, that's just factually incorrect. Call of Duty, despite sharing the same gameplay foundation from game to game, in its best years still managed to improve on itself with not only unique campaigns and side mode experiences like Zombies and Spec Ops, but also unique forms of multiplayer progression and new, fresh game modes that make every game in the series its own unique beast. There's a reason why the addition of Zombies in World at War, Party Games in Black Ops 1, and the Choose Your Own Path structure in Black Ops 2's campaign was so impressive and welcomed at the time. And that's because it was new and unlike anything anyone had played prior. And let's not even mention the other things I already brought up in my video that make every COD entry different from each other, such as overall tone and setting, weapons, maps, etc. These changes, despite building on the similar gameplay foundation, are substantial, and I seriously don't get why some like to treat them like they're not. FIFA, and by extension most sports games, do almost nothing to change up how the game feels every year. Just a simple roster swap and nothing else. No real change to gameplay or mechanics. Similar sequels or games that build upon the same foundation as previous entries are not inherently bad or lazy, but what matters are those additions that feel substantial and give players a new, fresh experience. Let's compare Call of Duty to another Activision franchise. Tony Hawk. Yeah, I'm going there. From a very surface level view, you can say that every Tony Hawk game is the same. It's got the same controls, the same real-life skaters to play as, the same tricks and trick inputs, and the same gameplay format of completing goals alongside getting points and trick combos. But die-hard fans of the series will immediately tell you how wrong that mindset really is. Every Tony Hawk game not only has substantial differences within its level design and goal formats, but also through subtle yet meaningful additions to the moveset to give players more freedom in how they play. Pro Skater 2 added the ability to manual and keep your combo going across the ground. Pro Skater 3 added the balance meter for grinds alongside the ability to revert when landing from a quarter pipe so you can continue your combo. Pro Skater 4 completely axed the 2 minute time limit, allowing players to achieve goals and explore the levels at their own leisure, alongside the ability to spine transfer from one QP to another for even more combo potential. And the underground games would bring forward a more concise single player narrative as you start from the bottom and rise to the top, alongside the ability to get off your board and run around not only with the ability to continue combos, but also precisely explore the levels more, which were bigger than ever. And let's not even mention the ability to create your own park in Pro Skater 2, or the addition of online and split-screen multiplayer in 3 onwards, not only allowing you to compete directly with others on who can get the most points, but also participate in other game modes like Capture the Flag, both of which would improve more and more as the series continued. And mind you as well, like Call of Duty, Tony Hawk was an annualized series for over a decade, and at least up until Thug 2 in 2004, managed to stay consistent in quality while also innovating in meaningful ways every year. Now, does this mean that Activision's annual release format is good for either franchise? God no. And the annual schedule was a large factor as to why the series suffered hard in quality from around 2006 up until 2020 with the release of the Pro Skater 1 and 2 remaster. My point overall, yet again, is that acting as if Call of Duty has the same amount of depth within its changes as something like sports games is just not right. There's a lot more depth to it than you might think. A lot of people were also a bit confused if I was focusing more on the single player or multiplayer side of things. And while in retrospect I was focusing more on the multiplayer side, I should have dedicated a portion of the video to the single player argument, since it is a sticking point for a lot of people. Halo and especially Call of Duty typically tend to have more campaigns designed in a linear fashion with a slower pace compared to retro shooters in most instances, which might not click for fans of those types of games, and I totally get that. That's not to say these types of games are inherently bad, or hell, not even that variation doesn't exist in those games either, even in the case of COD with campaigns like Cold War, BO2, and even Infinite Warfare. But yet again, as I mentioned prior, a lot of the issue for many came down to just how frequent the Call of Duty campaign format was shamelessly copied throughout the 7th gen, killing off fast arena shooters as a result and making everything just blend in together. 
I don't think it's right to say that those games ruined shooters, but developers did learn the wrong lessons from their success, and it killed off variety in the genre as a result for about a decade. Franco also makes a really good point about Counter-Strike, and how there is an overlap at a lot of points between predominant fans of more retro shooters alongside more slow, tactical ones. Again, a lot of this all comes down to personal taste at the end of the day, and it really all varies from one person to another. Now, the most common comment I've gotten on that video that honestly bothers me the most are the people that say, uh, yeah, that looks slow to me as a fan of this game, in response to that one section where I showed Halo 3 gameplay from Mitblitz, directly in response to the people that claimed Halo was a slow game. A lot of people took this as me saying that Halo was as fast as an arena shooter like Doom and Quake, which isn't true. Halo and many other modern styled shooters do indeed have a comparatively slower pace. I won't deny that for a moment. But my point with that clip was to disprove the myth that Halo is a slow game, because it isn't. It has its own fast pace, which while not as fast as something like your standard arena shooter, is enjoyable in its own fashion. Let's go on to discuss Doom Eternal and its skill elitism issue. Admittedly, a lot of this isn't an issue nowadays within the community, although I could have worded some things differently and also cross-section a bit alongside Halo and COD, since it does share some issues with that as well. Franco mentioned specifically the focus on esports and SBMM as a priority in both recent COD games and Halo Infinite, and how it's impacted those games negatively, and I totally agree. I don't think esports are bad to take part in for the record. It's totally a cool thing for people who want to do it. But there's a reason why so many people not only complained about the absolute strict amount of SBMM in Cold War at launch and overpowered metaguns in Vanguard and Warzone, but also why so many people have been rolling their eyes when they see someone playing the MW2 beta like it's Modern Warfare 2019, trying to use slide and reload canceling and all those other weird specific exploits that make you look like you snorted 15 gallons of Mountain Dew flavored G Fuel. This primary focus on competitive and professional play actively impedes casual players' enjoyment of the game as a whole, and especially things like SBMM in casual quick play playlists actively fuck over the learning curve of COD and trying to improve at it over time. People just want a casual Call of Duty experience again, and it's exactly why fans have been looking to the past with the original MW2 from 2009 as a basis for what they are hoping Infinity War does with its newest entry. Because while MW2 wasn't exactly balanced the best, it was a blast to play, and that addicting combat loop just kept people coming back for more. But it sadly doesn't seem likely, just for the fact alone of how much money esports makes for the developers and publishers alone. That's where the money is, so a company like Activision will follow that no matter what, even if it completely alienates a good majority of the player base, which sucks. And even similarly with Halo Infinite. Sure, the series is one of the few alongside COD directly responsible for making esports and particularly MLG a household name during the early 2000s, but at the same time, it feels as if 343 has forgotten Halo's original multiplayer roots in that respect, even if the gameplay is solid. Halo started off as just a fun, split-screen couch co-op shooter, with competitiveness having no priority or consideration whatsoever. And sure, it was very unbalanced, but it was a blast for a lot of people. It was so enjoyable that people literally lugged large tube TVs and LAN cables around to various houses just so that they could play with up to 16 players in the days before Xbox Live. People just want Halo to be fun on a casual, social level again. And it's not to say we can't have an experience for both casual and competitive players either. Halo 3 is agreed by almost everyone to be the absolute peak of the series in terms of multiplayer, just for how not only it was fun for both casuals, but even for competitive players as well. There was something for everyone in that game, and one side never impeded the other. I really do think that balance can totally be done nowadays, but again, it's unfortunately not likely to happen as competitive gaming is just simply where the money is. A lot of people also brought up how my criticisms about Tag 1's difficulty change were kind of flawed, just for the fact alone of how the difficulty tweaks work in Doom Eternal. 
Feel it's too hard? Just turn the difficulty down one level. And honestly, yeah, you're kinda right. If you remember, I had a dumb mindset going into Tag 1 that I could totally beat it on Nightmare in an afternoon, because in my eyes, I knew everything about Doom Eternal. And I was miserable as a result during that first playthrough due to me being stubborn and unwilling to learn the new ways to approach combat the game was trying to teach me. I was expecting there to be no balancing difference between Nightmare in the base game and Nightmare in Tag 1, and initially I felt it was bad as a result, which was pretty dumb. And I only began to appreciate Tag 1's design more when playing on a lower difficulty and then working myself up to Nightmare. I still do feel that a lot of the changes save for the initial encounter of the Possessed Baron in Blood Swamps are unnoticeable, but I do feel that id could have done their initial rebalancing in a better fashion without completely changing how the DLC felt on a high difficulty. I think having a message of some kind telling the player that the DLC is designed to be much harder than the base campaign would have helped in making mine and others' first runs less miserable. On the topic of negative criticism about Doom Eternal specifically, Franco mentions people like Synthetic Man in DW Terminator who just flat out lied about certain mechanics of the game and attacked those who did like them as rabid fanboys, and I do get the outrage in that regard. If you're attacking an opposing group in your criticism, then yeah, that's bad, and you totally deserve the backlash for being such a dick. But at the same time, I'm sorry, I still feel as if these people really don't matter in the long run and really should be ignored. Don't get me wrong, they deserve constructive criticism especially if they're acting that hostile towards the people they disagree with. Not gonna deny that one bit. But again, I really feel that it's kind of a waste of time to change people's minds like that, since in a lot of cases they just are that stubborn and refuse to change their minds. And you know what? 2016 isn't gonna go away anytime soon. It'll always be there if they like that game more. So long as they let us like our game in peace, they can like theirs. Again, it's all about mutual respect at the end of the day. And last, but certainly not least, let's focus on what is probably my biggest mistake with the video, and that is my unnecessary hostility regarding Under the Mayo. In my video, I made a jab towards him for his Halo Ruin First Person Shooters video, and I grossly misunderstood the video in such a way that I portrayed its message in a way that wasn't meant to be taken, and that is completely my fault. I took the video as a generic Halo bad because XYZ, woe is me, why don't people like the games I do sort of deal, which isn't the case at all. Rather, Mayo specifically talks about his personal experience with Halo, how it didn't click with him at first, and the frustration that he and others felt when developers took the wrong lessons from it and implemented its gameplay mechanics into nearly every FPS during the 7th gen. And he even says how he's gone on to revisit Halo in recent years and find enjoyment in it when separating it from his initial personal experience and how the industry would try to constantly copy it afterwards. The man doesn't hate Halo at all, and totally gets why people love it. But the whole point of the video was to tell his personal experience, and why some people feel the way they do about the subject. And yeah, I know Mayo even said in his response to Shredded Nerd that even he admits he could have phrased some things differently, but I feel this tidbit alone really kind of shows how wrong I was and really didn't do a good job listening to him and what he was really trying to say. You'll notice in my video that when I talked about what I didn't like about Halo, I mostly, if not entirely, used the past tense to describe how I felt or to describe things I would do or think while playing it back when it came out. Was, 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 couldn't, was, I thought. This specific use of language alone is a big sign to tell the kind of thing he was trying to say. That it was how he felt back then as compared to now, and I can only blame myself for not picking up on that. I'm gonna be honest, especially a year or so ago, I had a really hard time trying to pick up on criticism on the things I enjoy in such a way that it didn't feel personal to me. And a lot of what I said during that era kinda came down to raw emotion, which wasn't the best move for me as I ended up blocking out a lot of healthy discussion that meant well. I was against Mayo's video back then because it was something I heard all too many times before. 
and to me, it just felt like conditioning another generation of gamers to lock themselves out of something they might enjoy. Stepping back and re-examining it a while later, I now realize that wasn't the case, but I can't help but feel bad for even just slightly adding onto an unnecessary hateful bandwagon. In general, I really can't help but feel, especially now, that a lot of this hostility towards Mayo is just for him having differing opinions than others and nothing else. And I'm sorry, but that's just petty and immature. Especially when people are that obsessed to the point where they make literal hour-long response videos about why he was so wrong for what he said, and acting like it's such a crime against nature like I was. It's just pathetic and uncalled for if you ask me. Even when I tried to negate this negativity by pinning that one comment, I was still met with a good amount of people saying that I was wrong because, of all things, his God of War video was bad. Like what? Ignoring the fact that I haven't touched a single God of War game in my life, what does his opinions on another game, not even in the same genre, have to do with me blatantly missing the point of his original video and trying to correct that? It doesn't, plain and simple. And in fact, I may as well just get this out of the way now. If you personally don't like Mayo's content or disagree with his opinions, that's totally 100% okay. I won't stop you. But please do not use my dumb mistake to justify shit-talking him or spreading negativity towards him in my comments or anywhere else. I'm not the type of person to police comments, positive or negative. But some of the stuff people have said about Mayo in the comments of my video have legitimately made me feel a bit uncomfortable in terms of how hostile they are towards him. And the last thing I ever wanted to do was create a hate mob towards him or anyone else. I firmly believe in treating people with respect no matter what, whether I agree or disagree with their arguments, and trying to understand them to the best of my ability. That was something I didn't do back then, and that is completely my fault. And please don't take this either as me trying to damage control or backing down from what I was trying to say. Again, I completely misunderstood the point of what he was trying to say, and I painted it and by extension him as a person in a false negative image. And I feel it would be disingenuous to treat it as if I was completely fine in what I said, because it wasn't. Everyone deserves a chance to be heard, and I wasn't willing to listen properly to any of Mayo's arguments. On a side note as well, a lot of people were wondering if I just plain ignored or didn't know that Mayo's response to Shredded even existed in my original video, and the truth is that Mayo's response didn't even exist when I first put my video out. I don't blame people for assuming that for the record, considering how a lot of attention on that video came so long after I first uploaded it, but Mayo's response didn't come out until about a month or so after I put out my first video. I just wanted to clear that up since I have seen a lot of people ask that. And that's about it. I hope I've made my points and message overall clear due to everyone. Again, this isn't meant to be aggressive or negative in any way towards my commenters or Franco. They've genuinely helped me in re-examining the video and I felt this was kind of overdue with how much attention the video's gotten and how old it is. I just care a lot about this genre and this topic, so if I sounded angry or anything, don't worry. It's just because I'm really passionate about this thing. Alright, thanks again for listening everyone. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you guys next time.